Hi everybody, today we're going to begin our series of lectures on CBT techniques. Today we'll be doing CBT techniques one. These lectures will largely mirror your Judy Beck book, but I wanted to go through them with you as well so we can discuss some of the things that I found useful. So as you know, um, CBT techniques, which we're going to be talking about primarily in this course, are the ones that currently have the most empirical support. Again, as we've just talked about in some of our online lectures, that doesn't mean that they are the end-all and be-all. There are obviously other techniques that work as well, but these are the ones that are most commonly practiced, and again, they have the most empirical support, and I think it's useful for you to learn a lot of these techniques, because regardless of your theoretical orientation, many of them are very much useful. So CBT looks at the interplay, as you can see in this Venn diagram, between your thoughts, your behaviors, and your emotions, and that's kind of what CBT encompasses. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I did my postdoc with Aaron Beck at the University of Pennsylvania, so that has largely influenced my um, my theoretical orientation, but also how I view the world, and I got some wonderful um, supervision from Dr. Beck. It was wonderful hearing about how he developed cognitive therapy and kind of the naissance of the field. Um, and I was also fortunate to um, work with his daughter. We would often go to the Beck Institute where they would do um, live therapy sessions and we got to observe and have discussions afterwards. So it was a great opportunity. Dr. Beck is now in his 90s and still alive, still working, still publishing. He's a um, pretty amazing fellow. So today we're going to be talking about what is CBT, the cognitive model, session structure, we're going to be, and then we're going to be introducing the DTR, which is going to be um, your blog assignment number two. <clears throat> so what is CBT? CBT therapy is an action-oriented form of psychosocial therapy that assumes that maladaptive or faulty um, thinking patterns cause maladaptive behaviors or negative emotions. So basically, um, I think I mentioned this before, this is kind of the, the relationship between your thinking patterns and your behaviors. And I think a lot of you can relate to this because many times we all have, you know, it's not just people with psychopathology that have dysfunctional thoughts. We all do. You know, like how many times has something bad happened to you and you kind of think, oh, nothing good will ever happen to me again. Well, and then you, you feel pretty crappy for the rest of the day. So we know that's not necessarily true, but in the moment you believe it and therefore it impacts your mood, your behavior etc. So I think it's very much something that we can all relate to as human beings and I find that it's very intuitive and, and it works well with patients. So CBT treatment focuses on changing the individual's thoughts um, or cognitive patterns in order to change his or her behavior and emotional state. So um, the blog exercise for blog number two is going to be talking about the dysfunctional thought record and how we can work on changing people's thought patterns, um, which I think is kind of really exciting and it really does work in practice. So what is cognitive behavioral therapy? Um, it's a blend of cognitive th therapy and behavior therapy. So behavior therapy is very much based on kind of changing people's behaviors, not really thinking so much about what the internal kind of stimuli, the little homunculus within the mind, whereas cognitive therapy focuses a lot on changing thoughts and beliefs, and cognitive behavioral therapy is really the interplay between the two. Interestingly, um, you know, as Dr. Beck is the founder of cognitive therapy, I thought when working with him, you know, that would be primarily the focus, but, but true cognitive behavioral therapists, as you see, um, in the Judy Beck book, employ both techniques, as does Aaron Beck. I think that he would argue that you know you need to do both. You have to change the thinking styles and consequently the behaviors. And sometimes you change the behaviors before you can think, change the thinking styles. Some people are just more thought focused, and some people are more action focused. And that's your job as a clinician is to assess um, what works with your client. So interestingly, cognitive therapy was was pioneered by Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis in the 1960s. Basically, simultaneously, the two of them came up with these um, this kind of these techniques of of how the thinking process has influenced behavior simultaneously. Both were medical doctors, both were trained as psychoanalysts, and both of them kind of felt similarly that. Um, that there, there was a lot lacking um, in psychoanalysis and that that really looking at some of these thought patterns that they were seeing, you know, dysfunctional thought patterns that they were seeing with their, their clients um, would make a huge difference and that they both pretty much simultaneously developed um, cognitive, cognitive therapy um, for, Al, for Aaron Beck and rational emotive behavior therapy for Albert Ellis. Um, we're not going to go into REBT um, in this course. If you're interested, I have, a, um, you know, some handouts I can send to you. It's very similar. It's virtually the identical thing. Albert Ellis was um, 
based here in New York City. He passed away about five years ago, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, a little bit of disrepute. He'd actually argued with people from his institute and was actually kicked out of the Albert Ellis Institute um, and was uh, looking, was having a, a rough time towards the end. But um, Albert Ellis, those of you who know um, rational emotive behavior therapy, it's it's a little bit more confrontational. Um, Albert Ellis's techniques were a little bit more radical, as he was a more radical human being, whereas cognitive therapy is a more gentle therapy, um, and I think it reflects the personalities of the, of the creators. But essentially, basically, both of them are talking about changing thoughts in order to change behaviors. So cognitive therapy assumes that maladaptive behaviors and disturbed mood or emotions are the result of inappropriate or irrational thinking patterns called automatic thoughts. And these are the thoughts that kind of immediately pop into your head when something happens like, oh, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, I'm never going to do anything right. And, you know, again, while those are probably more prominent in people that have um, psychological disorders, I think we can all relate to them because we all have them at some point or another. I think all of us, you know, have some perfectionistic tendencies in us, otherwise we wouldn't be in graduate school. Um, and hence, you know, in order to be a perfectionist, some of our thought patterns are a little more rigid than they should be, and they sometimes cause us more problems than they should. Um, so oftentimes we find ourselves, instead of reacting to the reality of the situation, an individual reacts to his or her own distorted viewpoint of the situation. This is really kind of when the reaction outweighs the event. I don't know if you've ever, this has ever happened to you, um, but you're talking to somebody, you say something, and all of a sudden they kind of freak out at you, and you're like, whoa, I didn't say anything that you know drastic. But they weren't reacting to what you said, but they had some internal thing going on in their head they reacted to and they had a much more serious reaction um you know i i've had that you know in arguments with my husband for example not to say that my husband and i argue but well everybody argues <laughs> sometimes when i'm talking to myself you'll find that i i kind of babble on so you'll forgive me but sometimes when my husband and i have discussions um i find myself having very strong emotional reactions to something very you know innocuous that he's said and it comes down to some you know distorted cognitions that i have and then when i actually put that in check and kind of realizing that i'm my reaction is very disproportionate to the situation at hand so cognitive therapists attempt to make their patients aware of these distorted thinking patterns or cognitive distortions and change them. And this process is called cognitive restructuring. So these are some of the terms that you're going to be reading about in your book um, and that we're going to be discussing throughout you know, the, the remainder of the course. So we have the situation that occurs and as a consequence we have a thought. Um, that thought can then result in a physical reaction or a mood or a feeling which then can result in a behavior. Um, you know, I think that we've all felt, you know, that, that anger inside us, that emotion swelling and therefore we react, you know, with, uh, we yell, for example, if we're feeling angry or if we're feeling sad, we can cry. And so I think I gave you this example before and forgive me if I have not, and I know I give it to you in the other class, but this is my favorite example is, you know, you're walking down the street and I'm pretty sure I gave you this example, but again, somebody looks you up and down and then your thoughts really influence how you view that situation so either that person thinks I'm beautiful and I'm sexy um, and therefore you feel good and then your your behavior is that you you know you your you have this uh, your physical reaction is that you have this happy feeling throughout your body and then you're holding yourself high you're walking down the street you know with your held held your head held high in another situation your thought is that they think you're, you know you're ugly your outfit sucks your mood and your feelings then are kind of you know low you feel sad you feel rejected you have a physical reaction where you kind of feel this heaviness and consequently, you know, your behavior, you're holding yourself down, your shoulders are hunched, you put your eyes contact to the floor, you don't want to encounter any more people looking at you because you feel you look kind of ugly. So it's very much the same situation, it's just a very much uh, your interpretation of it that can influence your behavior. So behavior therapy or behavior modification trains individuals to replace undesirable behaviors with healthier behavior patterns. So this is where we're going to be talking about changing, you know, problem solving strategies, coping styles, etc. So you'll often find that depressed patients one of the things we know that makes them feel better is when they go outside and do stuff, but the depression itself makes them kind of more introverted and they want to kind of um, hide away from the world, which is really counterproductive because that in turn makes them feel more depressed. Like how many of you have ever, you know, spent the entire weekend in your apartment without leaving you, and in your pajamas, you kind of feel pretty bad by the end of the weekend. Um, so one of the therapies that is suggested for people is called behavior activation where you kind of get people out and get them moving so 
You want to teach people healthier behaviors. You want to teach them how to react to situations more appropriately. Um, and, and CBT obviously does both the cognitive restructuring as well as the behavior modification. So unlike psychodynamic therapies, it doesn't focus on uncovering or understanding the unconscious motivations that may be behind the maladaptive behavior. I think a lot of people interpret this as that we don't care about the reasons for it or we don't care about the past. And that's not true in the sense that we understand that your learning patterns um, are based on your history. So for example, if you were abused and neglected as a child, that's obviously going to influence who you are today and how you behave and react to situations. So I think that it's integral to understand that and to, to, to have that context when working with somebody because their reactions um, to interventions and to the world are going to be very much based on those experiences they had in childhood. However, unlike psychodynamic therapies where you kind of keep focusing on the past and trying to kind of reconcile that we in CBT kind of focus on the present like I can't go back and stop somebody from molesting you as horrible as that may have been or I can't go back and change the way you know your mother treated you or your father treated you or or your peers bullied you I mean that is very traumatic and I know that's very difficult for many people or difficult for everybody um, but we can't change that but what we can change is how you handle that today I mean unfortunately many um, people have had traumas in their in their childhood and but what we can do is kind of teach them to say you know it sucks it's really it is very sad that this happened to you and I wish it didn't happen to you but at the same time I can't change it and what I can do is is change how you kind of handle that situation going forward and how you cope with it and how you 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 know because you're gonna have problems as a consequence of that and how can you cope with that in the most effective manner um, people who are strictly behavior therapists don't try to find out why their patients behave the way they do. They just teach them to change their behavior. Um, and here again, as I mentioned, it's important to understand the learning history and how that influenced present day behaviors. Um, so again, strict behavior therapists aren't so concerned with the cognitions, but CBT therapists are really interested in the interplay. And I think that's integral as we learned last time for your, cognitive, your case conceptualization is understanding why people are behaving the way they're behaving today. So cognitive behavioral therapy integrates the cognitive restructuring approach of cognitive therapy with the behavior modification techniques of behavior therapy. The therapist works collaborative, collaboratively with the patient to identify both the thoughts and behaviors that are causing distress and to change those thoughts in order to readjust the behavior. And I think the word collaboratively is really key here because unlike kind of traditional psychotherapists, this really is very much a partnership. It's a much, a very much an active psychotherapy. So, you know, in traditional psychoanalysis, um, the patient does a lot of the talking, the therapist does a lot of the interpretation. Um, here, the therapist and the patient are working together. It's almost like a psychoeducation at times where you're kind of teaching them different skills, different techniques, they're giving you feedback. So, you know, if you look at the average kind of length of talking in a session of CBT, you'll see it's about 50-50 patient therapist. And the, the patient is very much seen as an equal collaborator. There's not really a power differential between the therapist and the client. So elements of CBT. What I love about the Judy Beck book is she talks about the structure of therapy. And I remember the first day that I was at the Beck Institute doing therapy, I really I had her book in front of me, and I you know I I copied out the the key elements of of the structure, and that was really helpful to me when conducting therapy because so much of it is really about being organized um, and I think that's a lot of what distinguishes CBT from some other therapies you have to have a plan and a goal and that's not to say that you're not going to deviate at some point but in order to make effective change you have to have structure and I think that helps patients too it's just like children you know do much better when they know what's going to be happening next so do patients so you you very much you know the structure is very much established and you establish that in the first session because again if you think about learning history if the first session you let the patient talk kind of willy-nilly that's what they expect and so therefore you have to kind of retrain them and you don't want to have to do that as much as possible so when we talk about structure in the first session again Judy book describes this very nice Judy Beck sorry describes this very nicely in her book but you want to establish trust and rapport and you guys have already had some experience doing that with your first blog exercise and then you want to socialize your patient into therapy explain to them what psychotherapy is many of them have come to you without knowing first of all what psychotherapy is second of all what cognitive behavioral therapy is or whatever orientation you practice and really what to expect and so you kind of have to socialize them and explain to them what psychotherapy is and what they should expect some people are very knowledgeable but I think for the most part people really aren't I can't tell you how many people have come into my office sat down on the couch put their feet up and lied down and said okay doc tell me what I need to do 
And so explaining them about the, you know, the active nature of the therapy, the cognitive model, you know, I often have handouts which are in your contents folder that you can give to them. They're also, you know, you can find many of these handouts on the internet, just explaining to them um, what psychotherapy is, what the cognitive model is, or the cognitive behavioral model, and how you're going to plan on working with them. You also want to educate them about their disorder. So you may or may not have a diagnosis at this point. They may come to you with a specific diagnosis. Um, they may not. I often, if I know ahead of time what the patient has, will have a printout. I might have some research for them as well. I'm talking about how therapy can improve, um, you know, symptom or can cause symptom reduction um, in people with this, the disorder that they have. Oftentimes people are not aware um, that the symptoms they're experiencing are part of a psychological disorder, like the problem sleeping, problems eating. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, for example, I remember when I was in college, I had TMJ and I went to see my doctor because I was in a lot of pain and I couldn't really open my mouth and the doctor looked at me and he goes you have a psychological disorder and I looked at him and I go I'm a, I'm you know studying to be a psychologist I don't have a psychological disorder when in reality um, my TMJ was in part related to me clenching my teeth which is something that I did when I was anxious well I would not meet criteria for um, an anxiety disorder it was a behavior that I engaged in because I was feeling tense and so I had to learn to relax my jaw and so understanding this relationship was actually quite helpful to me um, and and therefore you know it helped me when as I was doing some of the relaxation exercises you want to normalize difficulties and instill hope you know talking about how you've seen patients if you have who've had similar issues to them and you've helped them overcome them and definitely you believe that you know that you you can help them improve their symptom presentation this is where the research comes in handy saying you know using cognitive therapy or using CBT people who have symptoms similar to yours can definitely see significant improvements in their quality of life and, and that's where the research helps you and again sometimes I will give um, people research articles where appropriate sometimes it can backfire on you I once gave um, research article to a patient with bipolar disorder and ultimately CBT you know or any therapy for that matter doesn't have the best outcome um, for bipolar disorder not that it doesn't make a difference but we're not seeing you know complete remission necessarily with CBT and the patient came back you know basically stating that to me and I had to then explain to the, to the individual you know the role of CBT in the treatment of bipolar disorder so you have to make sure that the articles that you give them um, will help them and will instill hope you also want to elicit their expectations for therapy so what do they think is going to happen what do they think therapy is going to be like and you want to make sure that their expectations are realistic for example you know, right now, currently, we do not have a cure for schizophrenia. Um, people with schizophrenia with medications can maintain very happy and productive lives. Um, and CBT can help, you know, maintain people on medications. They can help people cope with their stresses more effectively. But we're not going to necessarily help people. We will not be able to necessarily get rid of all delusions and hallucinations and keep them, you know, symptom free for the rest of their lives. And so you want to make sure their expectations for therapy are realistic. You also want to gather additional information. So at this point, they probably will have completed some kind of intake assessment. You're going to continue with that in the first session as well. And you want to gather additional information that's going to help you um, with your cognitive, your case conceptualization that we talked about in the previous lecture. So a lot of those questions about their history, um, you know, their previous therapy experiences, what they're here for, get a good sense of their symptom presentation, what they've been doing, what's working, what's not. And you want to collabor collaboratively develop a goal list for therapy. So this will be your overarching, you know, things that you're going to be working on. Now this may vary from session to session. You're obviously not going to work on all goals and all each session, but they have some, you know, it may be decreased depressive symptoms. It may be learn to um, make more friends. So these are might be overarching goals, and then you'll break those down into smaller goals that you deal with each session. So in structuring a therapy session, the first thing that you do is you do a mood check. So what I generally have is in the waiting room if you're doing outpatient psychotherapy or sometimes if that doesn't work out, just as they come in, I hand them, you know, a BDI and they'll fill it out very quickly. They they can do it in a few minutes once they're, they're used to it. And then I, I review it with the patient and I go over where they are this week as compared to last week. If there are any elevations, we discuss them, especially any indication of suicidal ideation. That's the first thing I discuss with the patient and I do a risk assessment when necessary. 
I do an update from the previous session. Obviously, if it's the first session, that's not going to take place, but just generally what happened during the week. I usually keep this to about five minutes unless there's something that they're going to want to um, discuss in session, and then I put it on the agenda. So we set an agenda for that week. So usually this is based on the goals that you set up initially in therapy. You're going to have overarching goals that you're going to work on, and the patient may also bring additional goals to the table based on what happened during the previous week, homework assignments, etc. You then review the past week's homework assignments, which is very important. Um, you know, if you give people homework and you don't review it, they're going to stop doing it, and homework is really important, as we're going to talk about momentarily. Then you start discussing your agenda items. You probably, the crux of the session is going to be talking about these agenda items. You usually have about 30 to 40 minutes, so you need to plan your time accordingly. And so if you have three to four items on the agenda, you prioritize them with the client. And then, you know, some agenda items might take more time than others. Um, and so if you find that you're running out of time and you're not going to be getting to everything, you need to kind of stop and take stock. And you say, you know, I know you wanted to talk about X, Y, and Z. Um, we're still talking about X right now, and we only have about 10 minutes left. Do you want to continue talking about X, or do you want to move on to, to touch on Y and Z a little bit now, or do you want to kind of defer those to the next session? And you let the client decide there. But that's also really important because you're keeping the session in check and you're keeping track of what's going on and that's it's really important to the organization of this of the session. Um, you want to intersperse capsule summaries. This is really important. You did this a lot in your therapeutic alliance exercise, but really summarizing, you know, after every few minutes what the patient's been talking about to make sure that you're on the same page and that you are hearing what the patient is saying. This is a good therapeutic alliance um, building technique, but it's also important because, you know, sometimes people, you think you understand what somebody is saying, but you really don't, and so you need to, to make sure you're on the same page. You then do a final summary at the end of the session where you summarize what you've discussed. Um, you then um, talk about the homework assignment. So you're going to assign some homework that is relevant to what you discussed about, that's some skill build, skills building technique that the patient can work on that week. Um, and we'll discuss kind of the nature of homework assignments momentarily. And then you elicit feedback. And I know a lot of you in your blog number one talked about how important getting feedback from your client was. And that's something that's integrated into the cognitive model or cognitive psychotherapy is really getting feedback from your client. Like, how did this go for you today? Is there anything you want to do differently? Um, so that you can adjust because you don't want your patient to stop coming to therapy um, if they don't like what you're talking about. You also, you know, if there's anything that you notice, like their behavior was off or whatever, you want to address that in session and not leave them, let them leave feeling as if something has not been addressed, like there, there's an elephant in the room. So homework is really an important part of CBT. It's kind of like, you know, when you think about historically when you have math homework, and if you just did math problems in class, that wouldn't be sufficient for your learning. You have to do them between class as well and practice them. Or if you take piano lessons, I mean, I tried this. I had a, a nun, Sister Betty, who gave me piano lessons. And, um, you know, towards the end, I really did not enjoy them. She was a very strict nun. And I, I stopped practicing. It was also like during my teenage years when other things were more important to me. And I came to my lessons without having practiced. And Sister Betty was none too pleased with me because um, I was not making any progress between sessions because I was not practicing. So same with psychotherapy. You're going to be learning a lot of skills, techniques, etc. And you need to practice them in your daily life. You know, they say that in order to make behavior change, you have to practice things for at least one to one and a half months in order to make that change kind of a more permanent part of your behavior. So the research shows that completion of homework is significantly correlated with outcome in cognitive therapy. So a meta-analysis of 27 studies um, indicated a 0.36 for homework effects and a 0.22 for homework compliance. So there, that's a, a moderate effect size for people completing their, their homework. So this suggests that homework is integral to, that's my word of the day, integral, is very important um, for outcome in psychotherapy, especially cognitive therapy. So homework serves a number of purposes. As I mentioned, it's generalizing learning from session into everyday life. It also fosters the independent practice of skills acquired during treatment, because a lot of the times you're going to be practicing these skills with your client, like doing the DTR, but these are things that you want them to learn to do by themselves, and so they have to be able to kind of, you know, cut the cord and be able to do these, and you want to make sure they're doing them, and then you can problem solve in the subsequent session if it didn't go well. It's important as you socialize your, your client to psychotherapy that you talk to them about the role of homework, that homework is an, is an elemental part of psychocognitive or cognitive behavioral therapy, and that they should expect to be doing homework in between sessions. It's not necessarily going to be 
you know, always a writing assignment, it could be thinking about something, it could be practicing something, it could be doing an exposure exercise, but there will be between session activities. And a lot of people don't like the word homework, there's a very negative reaction to it because, it, you know, people had very negative reactions to homework in high school, etc. So you might want to call it, you know, between session activity or something else, you know, practice, um, whatever your client prefers. I mean, you know, we're calling it homework here, but it can be called anything. Um, and then you explain to them the role of homework and why it's so important. So talk to them about what the research shows. Talk to them about how it's important to generalize and practice independently. Um, so how do you decide on a homework assignment? So you want to make decisions co um, collaboratively. So you want to, you know, oftentimes you'll be the one that's going to come up with the homework assignment, although sometimes they may come up with it. They may say, you know, I really was thinking about this and I'd like to practice some of that for homework. And then you say, great, that's a great homework assignment. Um, you always want to reinforce patients when they come up with something on their own, even if it's not necessarily something you would choose, you can maybe modify it to be something that you think could be beneficial. But again, you want to, mo you want to re reinforce them for kind of, um, having the initiative to come up with things that they want to do to make behavior change. Um, you know, the presenting problem is going to guide the, the homework assignment. So people who have anxiety-related disorders, a lot of it will be more exposure-based. People who have depressive-related disorders will be more, you know, cognitively based, depending on, you know, what the, what the disorder is. Things like, you'll be doing things like exposures for, you know, anxiety-related issues, DTRs for, uh, cognitive distortions, behavior activation, those are kind of common assignments that you'll be giving out, problem solving, etc. And uh, a good, you know, if, if there's nothing that you can think of, and especially in the first session or first few sessions, you might have the individual come up with agenda items for the next session, especially if they're kind of not really clear on what to do in psychotherapy. This really helps them um, feel like they're part of it and, and engaged somewhat. You also want to review the homework each session, as I mentioned, because if you do not review it, patients will very quickly stop doing it. Um, and you have to discuss what got in the way if a client was not able to complete the homework assignment. You want to problem solve. You want to be realistic. Like everybody, life comes, you know, gets in, in the way. But homework is really important, and they're paying a lot of money to come to psychotherapy, or they're investing a lot to come to psychotherapy. And so homework is a really important part of that. So it's not just the hour a week that they're with you that is psychotherapy, it's all the hours in between. And so you have to make sure then that you come up with assignments that they could do. You assess the likelihood of a client completing a homework assignment. So, you know, as a novice therapist, I was very guilty of assigning people all sorts of different homework assignments and they'd come back and they didn't do anything because it was all too overwhelming for them. So you want to make homework simple, something that they can very easily complete. The likelihood that somebody can do the assignment has to be 90% or greater. When working with forensic populations too, you have to make sure that homework assignments are tailored to, you know, to literacy levels. I once had a sex offender freak out on me because I gave him, you know, a written assignment that we had to review in, in class and he couldn't read and I didn't know he was illiterate at the time and he got very, very upset and started, you know, acting out um, and that was because he didn't want to say that he couldn't read and couldn't do the homework. You also have to be careful, you know, we often have things with like sex offender treatment program on them and you don't want to out people um, in offending populations so you have to be very mindful of the, the titles of your, your homework assignments if you're giving written homework assignments. Um, so again, assess the likelihood with your client of completing the homework assignment, and again, you want to make sure that there's 90% plus chance that they're going to be able to do it. And if there's not, you just make it more basic. It can be something like thinking about something for five minutes, you know, two times a week. But the, prob the, the goal is really for have them to practice doing something between sessions. Um, and as they start doing that, then you can build on it. it. Homework shouldn't be taking up tremendous amounts of time, but yet it should be very helpful and contribute. Because if you're spending too much time dealing with, you know, what DBTers would call therapy interfering behaviors, it doesn't leave you a lot of time with dealing with, um, you know, the reasons that people came to therapy, although oftentimes the two are very much intertwined, and so you end up talking about the same thing. You know, many times people who don't do th homework have problems related to avoidance, which are causing their psychological issues, and so sometimes you can kill two birds with one stone. Um, I put a cognitive behavioral therapy note in your contents folder. I know we talked about notes before, but these are really just 
to, to help you with the structure of the session. So you have the date and number of the session, um, the objective rating, so you write down the BDI, BAI, and BHS scores if you're giving them to the clients. I've also put those in your contents folder, so you can use those if you're, if you're so inclined to do so. You put down the agenda, both yours and your patient's agenda items. Um, the brief overview of a session, you know, talked about this, 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 and this. Should be no more than three or four sentences. You write down what you've assigned for therapy, and then if there's anything that you want to remember that you need to to bring up next week, you write that at the bottom of the set of the note. So these are, um, you know, depending on where you work, they're going to be different. But from a CBT perspective, this is kind of the ideal um, note taking technique. So let's talk a little bit now about automatic thoughts. These are also known as dysfunctional or irrational thoughts, depending if you're thinking about it from an REBT, CBT, CT perspective. So what are automatic thoughts? They're the notions or ideas that occur without effort or choice that can be distorted and lead to emotional responses. Automatic thoughts provide data about core beliefs. So core beliefs um, to me are somewhat of a, you know, would, would overlap tremendously with psychodynamic principles. There's kind of like this um, id uh, feeling to it in the sense that these are things that, you know, oftentimes were developed in childhood and ingrained, you know, for example, if you were rejected by a parent, you develop a core belief of unlovability. Um, you may have a core belief that you're a failure. Um, a lot of it comes down to these feelings of rejection and unlovability and and so we have these irrational beliefs that are kind of these intermediate or surface thoughts that are related to these co these core beliefs. You know, because you feel, un you know, that nobody can love you, you feel like, oh, she doesn't like me. You know, that's kind of an automatic thought. Automatic thoughts are subject to cognitive distortions. So cognitive therapists have identified a variety of cognitive distortions that can be found in different psychological disorders. So there are typical, you know, thoughts that are associated with depression um, and, and more and typical thoughts that are associated with anxiety. Anxiety are more threat related, depression are more related to self esteem issues and, and feelings that way. So Cognitive distortions are systematic errors in reasoning, often stemming from early childhood errors in reasoning, and an indication of inaccurate or inf ineffective information processing. So you'll see that, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of these things stem from childhood because of, you know, things that happened, and so people develop these beliefs, and people often have cognitive distortions that are very much along a, a similar vein or theme, and this is related to the, the core belief to which they're, they're associated. We'll do more work with core beliefs next lecture. So one of the things that is kind of helpful sometimes with your clients, and, and you know, it's, a, it's kind of a fun exercise to do with them, and I say fun loosely, but um, I've given you some some cognitive distortion worksheets again in your co in your contents folder, but there are different types of cognitive distortions. So you have all or nothing thinking. This is when you know something is wonderful or something is horrible. This can also be considered to be kind of black or white thinking. So you know, like the whole world is against you, or you know, and I'm sure you've you've, you've encountered people like that. You have overgeneralization. So something has happened once; it's always going to happen. Discounting the positive. I'm guilty of this myself. I can be getting feedback from somebody that can say, you're wonderful, you're terrific, you're the best thing that's in sliced bread, but there's this one thing that I'd like you to change, and what do I harp on? What leaves me from that conversation is the one thing that needs improvement, and I can't get that out of my head. And so um, that's discounting the positive. Jumping to conclusions um, is when you kind of, somebody has said something, and you interpret something much more, you know, deep into it. Um, that's when your reactions are disproportional to um, to what is actually being said. Mind reading is when people say something and um, you interpret something completely different from that, which is very similar to fortune telling. You're believing, you know, what's going to happen in the future. You magnify or minimize, um, you know, negative things. So somebody might say something and it turns out, you know, like, I, um, you know, that haircut may not be the, the best haircut for you into, you know, you think I'm ugly and I'll never find love ever in my life. So you're kind of magnifying whatever somebody said. Um, emotional reasoning is when you use your emotions. So you have a, an emotional reaction to something and therefore you're attributing um, all your thoughts to that emotion making should statements. So there are people who are perfectionistic often make should statements. You'll find um, when doing downward arrow, a technique that we're going to be talking about next week or in the next lecture, um, 
it's kind of like, you know, I have to have things this way, or things have to be this way, or they should be this way. And then you say, like, um, you know, why should it be that way? And, they, and people can't really explain why it should. It just has to be that way. But why should it be that way? I don't know. It just has to be that way. So we have, you know, we, we have these, you know, um, irrational kind of thoughts about uh, what we, we say. I went to a talk um, by Albert Ellis once, and um, he liked to make funny songs. I'm sure you can find some of these on YouTube. And um, he had one song called Masturbation, which was basically his version of the should statement. It was like, masturbation, masturbation, where are you? And so he would like make these funny you know, um, songs for these cognitive distortions or irrational beliefs. Um, labeling is when you know you you put labels on things and overgeneralize. Inappropriately blaming um, generally yourself or other people. Catastrophizing we all do that when you you make things much worse than they need to be. Personalization you know um, is when people are talking to the group and I know I'm sure this has probably happened to you. You know when you were a kid they're like you know all you guys did this this and this and you personally feel like it was all your fault. So one of the things that we do in cognitive therapy is that we challenge these dysfunctional thoughts. So your client and therapist work together to examine thinking patterns and behaviors and change them so that the client can function more effectively. And um, the focus of the therapy is often on the distorted thinking and the assessment is quite detailed. So you're going to spend you know, the entire session sometimes working through a dysfunctional thought record and practicing with your client and going through some of these irrational beliefs or you know, a couple of them so that they have a sense of you know, their thinking style and how they are really making these inappropriate assessments. And then you work on coming up with techniques that challenge these distorted thoughts and replace them with more effective thinking. So you do this through th teaching self-monitoring, and that's really important because oftentimes clients are not a a aware of their thinking processes, and some clients may not be able to do this. You know, this whole kind of metacognition thing might be beyond them, and especially lower functioning clients, and so you might have to deal with the emotional level. Um, so it's it's hard sometimes, but you you kind of you know um, you have to to try to talk about the emotions that they feel and what are the, some of the thoughts associated with them and some people can't get past the emotions and so at that point you kind of deal with them at an emotional level but the cognitive restructuring might not come as easily and so with those kinds of clients behavioral techniques might be more appropriate. Um, so you ask clients to keep track of the records of events, feelings, thoughts and behavior so you, you have them notice whenever they have a change of emotion um, and and what's that? What that is related to? Um, just to give you an example, today I ran. I went to preschool to pick up my my son, and um, my daughter's former teacher um, came and saw me, and she told me that she was leaving. She was going to go on to do, to do her PhD, which is a very happy thing. But you know, it brought tears to my eyes because my son was supposed to go into her class next year, and my thought was, while I was happy for her, my initial thought was oh, you know, she's a really wonderful person. Is anybody going to love my son the way that she would have loved my son? Um, and so I felt kind of scared and worried. And that was, you know, my emotional reaction to that thought, even though it also could be a very happy thing. And I was happy for her for going on to do her PhD. And so I would note that in my dysfunctional thought record. Um, so let's go through a few of these. So I have one, I've posted... Um, uh, two forms of DTRs in your contents folder. There's also one associated with blog number two. Um, and so this is, you know, one that you can use. This is similar to the one that Judy Buck uses in her book on page um, 100, I believe, and 92. Um, no, sorry, it's 195 that she has um, a sample dysfunctional thought record. So the directions say, when you notice your mood getting worse, ask yourself, what's going through my mind now? And jot um, down the thoughts or mental images associated in the automatic thoughts column. You also want to talk about the emotions, which is the next column. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the alternate response and the outcomes in the next lecture. But in the first part, you're really getting your client to focus on identifying these types of thoughts, like just getting them to monitor their thinking before you go about challenging them. 
So you have them mon monitor their emotions. So people can often recognize, you know, when they get tears in their eyes, when they feel angry, when they feel happy. And so when there's a change in their emotions, have them write down what was going on, which is the situation. Um, I also posted a link to a YouTube video where a psych or a psychotherapist in uh, Toronto is explaining how to do a DTR, and she has patients do it at the end of the day. I mean, ideally, especially now that you guys all have your devices, you can do it in the moment. You can do it on your device. Um, such that you know it really is done in the moment because that's much more useful and that's how we want people to start doing it but i guess you know depending on people's schedules um you know it might be more useful to do it at the end of the day to reflect when they have more time and then you have them write down the automatic thought that went through their mind like what was the thought that was associated with that emotion and then how much do they believe the thought on a scale of one to a hundred so as irrational as it may have been how much do they believe that thought in the moment um so let's do um a practice here's an example so the date was 2 4 the time was 8 35 p.m. my husband didn't call when he said he would so the automatic thoughts that this person had is he's angry with me he's seeing somebody else he wants to leave me something terrible has happened to him he never calls when he says he will he does this to make me angry he doesn't love me so there are a lot of cognitive there are a lot of automatic thoughts associated with that situation um, and you know there are a lot of emotions that are associated with those thoughts if you think that he's angry with you you feel sad or scared if you think that he's seeing somebody else you feel anxious sad jealous potentially angry as well he wants to leave me you feel angry sad alone something terrible has hang happened to him fearful anxious he never calls when he says he will sad angry he does this to make me angry angry resentful he doesn't love me sad hopeless inadequate um, generally you want people to come up with at least two um, if not three sometimes you can help your client and probe for other things um, that they may have been thinking now to me all of this seems a little bit irrational it could be he was just busy um, and he didn't have time potentially his cell phone ran out of juice um, and that's kind of what we're we'll, we'll be doing a little bit later on but you ha you see like um, how this patient would have reacted very strongly to the situation even though potentially it didn't warrant it so the the emotions are very much out of proportion with the situation and that's when you know there's a lot of automatic thoughts going on and you can see here that there are Here's another dysfunctional thought record. Um, we're not going to do the last two columns right now. We can talk about those next time. But the situation was going on a vacation, ask a colleague to do some work with me. The thought was, she'll say, no, I'm not doing a good job. The boss thinks I take too much time off. So you feel anxious, guilty, sad. Um, you can also have here in the emotions patients labeling the cognitive distortions like all or nothing thinking, mind reading, fortune telling, overgeneralization. You also want to say the degree to which the patient believes those or the extent to which um, they feel those emotions. So here is 70%, 40%, 20% was the emotions. So um, the first thing you want to do with your client is again have them think about these situations and what emotions they feel. Um, you want to make sure that they can label their emotions. There's a disorder called um, dys, dys, no, I was saying dyslexia. It's not dysthymia either. It's um, uh, alexithymia, pardon me. Alexithymia, where people are not very good at labeling their emotions. So they have emotions, but they cannot label them appropriately. Um, and so it's important to make sure that your patients do understand the emotions and they can label them appropriately. And have your patients rate the intensity of the emotions as you saw in the previous slide. Have the patients monitor their thoughts for one to two weeks before moving on to the, the fourth column where you're talking about the alternative responses. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. So this should read beginning blog number two. Um, but I want you, before you start doing blog number two with your quote unquote client, to do with yourself. So notice when you yourself self start having changes in mood. Um, I want you to, to note those times for the next few days and then start writing down you know your automatic thoughts that were associated and the emotions that were associated so you can start noticing in yourself when these things are going on and then you're, we're going to next time talk a little bit more about how you challenge some of those thoughts and how you work with your client and so read the Judy Beck chapter on, on this um, read the blog assignment number two forgive me that I, I labeled it incorrectly here and then we're going to talk about how we challenge some of those cognitive distortions but again start doing this for yourself and then therefore you can kind of help your client do it if you have some practice doing it for yourself.